Hello, and welcome back to the Family's Fly Free Podcast. I'm your host, Lynn Mettler. As always, we've got a really good topic that I think a lot of you are going to be interested in today. We have lots of listeners and readers and members and followers who are part of the FIRE or FI or FI movement, um, and that stands for Financial Independence or Financial Independence Retire Early. Um, So these are folks who are looking to become completely financially independent, and they're working hard to do that. And um, we think that travel rewards and learning how to fly free and travel free pairs really well with this movement because it allows you to still enjoy traveling um, and enjoy your life, which for me is traveling, a big part of it, um, you know, while you're working toward this goal of financial independence and even afterward. So I have brought on with me today, um, Cami, who is part of our family's fly free team because she's a wonderful example of how she did exactly that. Um, and so she and her husband have achieved financial independence and they did use travel rewards um, throughout a good part of that and still do, you know, in order to keep traveling as they were working toward that. So Cami, I'm going to let you start by introducing yourself and just tell us a little bit about you. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks, Lynn, for having me on and hearing my story. I'm Cami, as she said, and I am the integrator, which means I'm mostly behind the scenes at Families Fly Free. I try to make things run smoothly so we don't have any glitches. I also lead some webinars and I help answer questions in the community with our members. And I also write for the blog. And everyone in the membership loves Cami's webinars. So if you haven't joined us yet, come on in. She's super organized and gives lots of great tips on planning and organization. Um, All right. So let's jump right into this. Um, So tell us, you know, how long you've been using travel rewards. And I'll just say Cami's been at this a lot longer than me. So tell us kind of how long you've been doing it and how you got started. Yeah, so I was thinking, oh, I maybe I've been doing travel rewards longer than some people have been alive. That's kind of <laughs> a scary thought. But young anyway. children, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so I was actually able to look up how long I've had an American Airlines frequent flyer account, which was my first one. So when you log into that, it actually tells you when you joined. Oh. And I have been a member since 1995, so almost 30 years. That's a long time. So how did you happen upon the idea of collecting and using travel rewards for your travels? Okay, so at the time we were living in the Dallas area and a friend introduced us to travel rewards because American Airlines has their hub in Dallas. um, That's what a lot of people fly, obviously. So he was telling us about how he had a credit card with American Airlines that was earning frequent flyer miles and he would, they were charging everything on their credit card. I'm like, what? You're charging your groceries? Who does that? Mm. But as he explained it more, I was like, oh, maybe that's, maybe that's a good idea because back then everybody was writing checks for everything, right? Like there weren't really, there what is were- a check? I don't remember. <laughs> There were debit cards, but I really don't think people were using them at stores yet. I think you could use them at ATMs to get money out, but using them at stores wasn't really a thing. Everyone was still writing checks. So that whole concept of even like, I'm one of those people that it takes a while for something new to like sink in. And so once he started talking to us about it more and I realized, oh, I could fly free for place to places, uh, sign me up. So that's how we get started. Were you surprised at, you know, this, the concept of that you didn't have to fly to earn frequent flyer miles, that instead you were earning them by charging to a credit card? I don't really remember, but I don't think so. Just because of how he explained it, Mm -hmm. you know, like what they were doing to do it, it wasn't because they were flying. So I don't think that was weird to me. Okay. Yeah. That was the the weirdest thing to me that, oh, you don't have to fly to earn frequent flyer miles, because that's what they're called. Right, exactly. (laughs) Okay, so 
So you and your husband have achieved financial independence, FI, as it's known in that community, or FI. Um, can you tell us briefly, I know it's a long story, but um, how you achieved it? And I think it's really inspiring to hear her story and um, and what they've done to, to get so far. The first thing I do want to say is that some of these steps weren't planned out. So we didn't like, you know, get married and have this plan all written out for what our life was going to look like. So some of these things just unfolded because of uh, just circumstances over our life. So I think it's good to have some plans um, if you're going into this, but sometimes things just happen that you don't really have any control over and it changes the course of your life. So step number one for us was drafting out a budget using a workbook from Larry Burkett, who most people don't know about him because he's old school. And um, he was way before Dave Ramsey came on the scene. I actually went and looked up when Dave Ramsey started his, you know, out of garage uh, broadcast or whatever. And it was 1992. So this was 1988. So I, I was quitting my job in order to stay home with my soon to be firstborn that year. So um, because of that, we went down to one income and we basically cut our income in half. And it became my job at that time to be the manager of our money. I had a degree in business administration. I hadn't really used it that much. So this was really um real world, real life experience at being an administrator of our right. business. Yeah. So um, my job was to see how we were going to pay all our bills at this new income level. And I want to note that our house payment at that time was half of my husband's take-home pay. Yikes. So when you listen to all these people, they're like, never make it 50% of your income. It'd be a third or in the right. it needs to be like 20 or 25%. But you know, we didn't know. So we were just getting started along this. It was too late at that point is what I want to say. Yeah. So step number two was living debt free. Um, we set the goal early on that we were going to have our house paid off by the time we were 40. And during those years, I never worked outside the home. Our income did increase, but our lifestyle did not increase at the same rate. We always lived below our means. Part of that started for us when we lived in St. Louis. Um, we had a house that we couldn't sell when we moved to Dallas. And so we rented that house out. And then when we bought a house in Dallas, we decided we're only going to buy a house that we can afford to make both house payments on just in case something happens. And I think for us was a huge smart move. And we didn't really realize it at the time. It just made sense for us to be able to sleep at night. But mm -hmm. that was the thing that helped catapult us, you know, even further mm -hmm. along. So we never had a house payment that was over $750. And any extra money that we had always went towards paying off our house. So that was step number two. Um, step number three was using real estate to grow our net worth, but not on purpose. So like I said, this house that we had back in St. Louis, the gal always made her rent payment. We never missed anything. We never had to pay both house payments. So we took all that money that we had, you know, basically saved aside just in case. And we put that on our, our house that we were living in. So you ended up with this house that you're renting out because you couldn't sell it. Right. So that kind of was providential to kind of get you into the whole real estate. Right. To kind of have that mindset. And it, and it was a good experience for us. It was in a, it was a nicer house. So we didn't, it wasn't, you know, in the hood. So we had somebody there that was taking care of it. She never missed paying us. Um, and then when we got ready to leave Dallas, we sold that house. We made a little bit of a profit. We moved to Colorado where it was more expensive, but because we had money from that house and we had money. We basically had our house in um, Dallas paid off. We just hadn't paid it off because we knew we were moving. And we took all of that, which was like $100,000, and put it towards our house in Colorado, which made it not as expensive as it really was for us. Okay, so not on purpose. Again, we moved to Colorado. We bought this first house. We moved out of that house after two years, and we made $40,000 in profit on that house. So then we moved into the next house and we lived there for four years. And when we got ready, it was out kind of out of town. Like it was like a 25 minute drive to Walmart. So we got kind of tired of that. 
Um, and at the time we thought the gas prices were expensive and we had a suburban, so we were spending a lot of money driving back and forth. So I'm like, you know what, let's move back to town. So we did that. And when we sold that house, we made $100,000 in profit. Wow. Yeah. So again, it wasn't something that we had planned. It's just the way our life worked out and the house prices in Colorado, you know, continually go up, it seems. So, um, but you made smart, you, when those opportunities presented themselves, you made smart use of those, I would say. Right. Right. But it wasn't, it wasn't intentionally doing that. It was the other life circumstances that made us move. Mm. Not the fact that, oh, hey, let's move because we can make $40,000. Right. That was, or a hundred thousand dollars. That wasn't it, but it's just how it worked out because of, you know, the housing market in Colorado at the time. So we moved into house number three, one month after we turned 41 and we paid cash for it. So we were pretty close on our 40 um, there and we were pretty happy about that. Yeah. So how did that feel? <laughs> that must have been um, amazing to be able to do that. Yeah, it, it was really weird because, well, at first I thought, oh, we're going to have all this extra money, but you always find something to spend it on because we you know, like I said, our house payment wasn't that high. So may, I think it was maybe, like I said, $750. So that's not a ton of extra money. And our kids were getting older. One of them started driving, you know, so it wasn't like we felt like we had this huge windfall of money because we had our house paid off, which was kind of interesting. So step number four was moving from that expensive part of the country to Indiana after my husband's company closed, not intentionally, but just because that's where he found a job. And the job was great because they had this huge um, moving uh, package. He was getting paid more money than we were making, and we were moving to a place that was more, less expensive. So again, that was, you know, not not intentionally moving to a cheaper place, but that's just how life worked out for us. When people would ask us, you know, like, why did you move here from Colorado? <laughs> yeah, I want to ask that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tom always said, it's because we got used to this thing called eating. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, he needed a job and the, the market just wasn't there during that time. Yeah. So... In our new location, while helping teach Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University at our church, I met a guy who basically mentored us into buying rental properties with excess money we had. So because we had moved to someplace where it was cheaper to live, we had this money sitting in our account. And as I got to know this guy, he was telling me about Basically, they had already achieved financial independence, and um, here's some things that he did to um, accomplish that. Why well, I had never thought Louis, about. Let's let's pause and define okay. financial independence. I, that just occurred to me as you're saying that. How would we define what financial independence is? Okay, I guess for us, um, it would kind of morph into what I was going to say next was basically okay. that we sat down and we made a plan of how we could accomplish um, having the same amount of money that my husband was making at his W-2 job in a passive or less um, sort semi-passive way, okay? So that was kind of what our, that was definitely what our goal was. We just went with, okay, we know we can live on this amount of money. Let's see what we can do to make it so that we can make the same amount of money, but he doesn't have to go to work every day. Mm -hmm. So That's yeah, you're earning the income you need to live on right. passively, totally passively. Right. Totally passively. So um, the other thing I would say was it took us, honestly, it took us about a year to get on board with that. And the, the thing that really made us get on board was that so many people say, oh, invest in the stock market. And when you retire, you're going to have, you know, $2 million. Well, that wasn't happening for us because we had seen the stock market drop three times in the 20 years we've been putting money in as 401k. And it was taking like 10 years to get back to where it was. So it was like, it was not happening for us. Mm -hmm. And so this guy convinced us, okay, if you put your money in real estate, 
it's a hard asset. It doesn't, unless the whole housing market drops, which it had in 2009, right. um, you're not going to lose money and you're not going to lose money because if you have renters in there, they're still going to be paying you. It's not like rent. When the housing market drops, you actually have more people renting houses because right. they've lost their houses. So it's never, it's never a bad investment. Um, if that makes sense. And then if the housing prices do go up, like they have over the last few years, then your house is worth even more than you paid for it. So another thing was, it was the timing, again, not on our part, but just how it happened to turn out that when we got into the real estate market, the houses were super cheap in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I know just in talking about like real estate versus stocks or whatever, I I've read, have been reading the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki book, but I know he's always saying like, as long as you at least make a dollar on that property, like they're paying at least enough rent to pay the mortgage that you're having to pay if you're, right. if you mortgaged it plus a dollar, you should be okay. You know, I mean, of course you want to make more if you can, but as long as it makes something um, and then appreciation over time is a sort of a bonus if that happens, right? Is that how you look at that? Right. Like we we bought into it never thinking anything was going to appreciate and then mm -hmm. it went crazy. So, um, yeah, so that that's just a bonus, like you said. So at that point, my husband and I sat down and this time we did intentionally map out the next five years of our financial lives. I have it written down on a piece of paper that I can go back and look at. And what we did was we um, we took the average rent that houses were getting here in Fort Wayne at the time, and then we multiplied that by okay, how many houses do we have to have to achieve my to to achieve his income? Mm -hmm. So then we said, okay, how are we going to get to that place? What money are we going to use? So we had three buckets that we used from um, to accomplish that. So one of them was. We used money that we didn't need to pay our bills every month, which in our budget was in our savings category. And, you know, it just happened to be the exact same amount that our first house payment was. So, um, which, like I said earlier, was half my husband's income at the time. So the second thing we did was we had decided that we were going to downsize from the house that we had bought here in Fort Wayne. Our kids were at college now. And so we sold that house. We took the money that we made off of that. We moved into a freestanding condo and we used the excess profits to buy more rental houses. And then the other thing we did was because we weren't living on any of the money that we were making from our rental houses, we used all of that money to put it back into the business. So it was a business. It's a business. Mm -hmm. So you're taking all the profits like you would with any business and reinvesting those um, in the business. So those were our three buckets of money. And over the over the course of those next five years, we did end up purchasing 20 rental houses with, wow. ca with cash. We didn't take out any didn't mortgage. Them. Yeah. So because you wouldn't we, get underwater. Yeah. Right. Well, and because we had this debt-free mindset from mm -hmm. doing debt freeze for so many years, I'm like, if this is going to work, this is going to work for us debt-free. It mm -hmm. has to, because that's how we live. And you made it work. We made it work. And I also want to mention that we were giving away about half, we were giving away about the same amount of money that um, Tom was making in those first few years of our marriage. So we've been very blessed by God. And we know that he has allowed us to achieve our goals. It wasn't just what we did. It was the circumstances he brought into our lives and a lot of other things. Yeah, I love that as a component of this, of giving. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Right. So the final step after those five years, once we had replaced my husband's income, which we did, um, was that he found out that he could work at his job, which was at a software engineer for a defense contractor. I mean, he had a good, solid job. You know, again, circumstantial. It, for me, it's always a God thing that he found out that there was another guy working at his work that was only working there part-time. So he went and talked to this guy and he found out I can work for 20 hours a week and I can still keep all of my benefits. And we're like, Oh, that's rare. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, 
what companies do that, especially mm-hmm. large companies like that. So we were like, um, I think that would be a good transition for us instead of you just like all of a sudden coming home. We don't, you know, we were like 51, I think at the time, all of, you know, you coming home, what are we going to do with our lives? Like we need some more thought and time, you know, for this. So because we had, because we had lived below our means for many years, we didn't have a house payment. We didn't have a car payment. Both of our girls were grown and married. Um, we could easily live on half of his salary. So that's what we did. Because we did that, this actually allowed us to double our passive income by using our rental house proceeds. So we only bought 20 houses, up to 20 houses, and then we stopped buying houses in 2016. And then we found some other ways to invest um, the money in other real estate endeavors. So I'll talk Mm -hmm. about those a little more later. Okay. And so, yeah, so that's, if you're living on half, what was half of his salary, and then you're still reinvesting everything, all your rental income, all of that back into that business. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's where I guess you start to see the, you know, things really start to speed up on their own, right? When you hit that critical point of, I don't know, a certain amount of income and you keep feeding it, then it just really spins and grows, I would think, right? Right. That makes sense. Right. And also like with momentum is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And we'll talk about this more later since we're tying this in, but we were traveling a lot when he went down to five, um, when, after the five years, when he went down to 20 hours a week, the interesting thing was that they also changed how they clocked your time. So you didn't have to be there for 20 hours a week. As long as you worked 40 hours in two weeks, um, you could, you could do that. And so we never, he never had to take vacation hardly anymore. Cause we would just, he would work 40 hours one week and then we would take the whole next mm. week off and go on mm. vacation or go to visit friends or go to visit family or whatever. So we also had this huge stockpile of vacation time when he retired. All right. So how long did it take for you to achieve your goal there? Okay, so there were so many things we already had in place to make this work because we were living below our means on a budget with no debt for all those years. But when we really buckled down and did it, it was those five years. So you have to have those things kind of in place Mm -hmm. um, before you can, you know, you could get serious about this from the get go. You know, if somebody today is 25 years old and they're just starting their career, go for it. (laughs) So you would say from the point where you like intentionally sat down and you made that plan. Yeah. From that point. Mm -hmm. And how does that feel now? Um, It feels great. It feels unbelievable. It feels, um, it feels like freedom. That's what I would say. It looks and feels like freedom. So I have a couple different points on that. One is obviously freedom with money. So we make this passive income from our rental house business. Um, We have a property manager. So if we don't want to do a thing, we don't have to. I mean, we never have to go look at a house if we don't want to. We don't have to lift a finger to do anything. Um, And then we also, like I said, with the money that we were making that we didn't need, uh, we invested um, in apartment syndications, which is basically you're a part owner in an apartment complex that somebody bought. And the way that usually works is they buy it, they um, update it, like maybe it was built in 1988, it's never been updated, they update it, and then later they sell it and make a profit. And then whatever percentage of the apartments you owned, you get the money for that. And then the other thing we do is we lend money to local people. Uh, local people, people that we know personally that flip houses. So those are the two things that we took our money that we were making from our rental houses and put our money into them. So that's how it really becomes totally passive is because (coughs) you're not having to do any of the work side, the fixing of toilets. (laughs) Right. I would say we're the managers of it. Uh We're the managers of these three businesses. Now there, there are things that we have to do. We have to keep lots of records and reconcile, you know, and 
wire money and get money back and go to the title companies and stuff like that. But it, that's very negligible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the other thing that we have is we have freedom with time. So now I can, I can do this. My husband's down fishing right now. He was like trying out his new, um, what did he call it? Some kind of fishing net that he has. He's going to try to catch bait fish. So like, that's what he's doing today <laughs> while we're doing this interview, right? Um, we can spend time with our grandkids. Um, another thing we can do is, and we've done this for a long time, is vacation when it's cheaper. Yeah, that's not, a big perk. Yeah, when there's not so many crowds. Um, we can grocery shop. Like I never grocery shop when there's a gazillion people there. I do any shopping I do, you know, on, I figured out that after dinner on Friday nights is a great time <laughs> to shop. You know, most people mm -hmm. are out going out to dinner, dinner or doing other things like that. And yes. so I found like in the evenings, there's hardly anyone out at the stores. So so that's something else. And we also have a subdivision pool and it's almost like our private pool because other, other people are at work. And so during the day, like yesterday, we went down there, there's nobody there. So it's almost mm -hmm. like we have this pool to ourselves, which is super nice. Yeah. So just total flexibility. Total flexibility. And then the, another thing I would say is we have freedom with our choices too. So um, when Tom started into the 20 hours a week thing, I actually started working for my real estate agent that had helped me um, secure all my rental houses. And I hadn't worked, okay, I hadn't worked at that point for almost 30 years. So it was, it was interesting, like I was just doing it one day a week to get in. And then I started, um, I volunteered to help you with your blog in 2019. So those two things kind of happened at the same time. And the one thing I want to say about that is that same year that I started working for you, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and they live um, like 600 miles away from here. So not an easy drive. And I was able to fly to be with her and my dad nine times over that next 14 months before she passed away. I would have never been able to do that if we weren't financially in a place um, where I didn't have to work all the time. Right. And I knew about Southwest Airlines and their totally flexible booking and cancellation policies. Um, I even wrote an article about it for the blog because it was like, I would just reserve all these tickets, not knowing when I would need to be there. And then as the time would come and they didn't need me that week, I would cancel. So like I did that so many times. Yeah. And that is a great perk that isn't talked about a lot. I mean, we talk about that you can change and cancel your flights on Southwest, but you don't really think about it being applicable in that way. And I had to do the same thing when I had a sick family member and you could just, I would just book it and be like, oh, nope, I'm not allowed to come down and see them that day. And so I could just change it to the next weekend or it's not a big deal. Right. And you can't do that with other airlines. I mean, no. I, if I didn't know about Southwest and that policy, I would have never been able to do that or lost so much money, you know, if I needed to go right now and I didn't already have some tickets reserved that I knew I could cancel. At the end of 2020, my real estate job ended. She know she was phasing out being in real estate, and you hired me as um, your integrator in May of 2021. So now, this is we're in 2022 now. My husband just retired in March, so he did actually quit working um, for that company at the age of 57, and he now works at Families Fly Free. Yay! Yeah. So it was so funny. Like you were, you were doing like, I don't know if it was for YouTube or doing, um, podcast or webinars or whatever, but I was like, you know, Tom knows how to do some of that stuff. He used to actually like kind of do that. And so, um, he started working for you. And even though you're really his boss, I'm kind of his boss. So we saw a shirt on one of our trips recently that said, I tried to retire, but now my wife is my boss. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's like totally true. Oh, I on. Yeah, I should have bought him that shirt, but I didn't. So, um, and then the other thing is, um, I would just wrap that up by saying we don't have to work. We don't need to work. 
but we're working because we want to work. So that's our choice. We enjoy what we're doing. We believe in the concept you've developed to help others to be able to spend time with their friends and family through the program um, and make great travel memories. And we think it's fun. So Yay. when it's not fun anymore, then we'll see. But so far it is. Yeah. And like, that's a, that's just a gift to, to work because you want to, right. you don't want to, you don't have to, you know? Right. Right. And then the other freedom that I think we have is we have freedom with location. So we can be anywhere we want to be for as long as we want to be. And um, Lynn, you know that my, I say this, you know, funny, but it's my goal is to be away from home as many days as possible. <laughs> so even though Fort Wayne is a great place to invest in real estate and live inexpensively, there's no ocean nearby, there's no cruise boat, there's no mountains, there's no waterfalls, and it's cold in the winter. So having our sport. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And overcast. <laughs> yeah, that's the permit cloud. We call it permit cloud. Yeah. <laughs> So having our home base here near where our oldest daughter lives, and that was the whole reason that we moved here was to be by her. Um, it's allowed us to be able to afford to travel a lot. So the last two years we've spent um, our winters, two months of the winter in Florida on the beach. And this year we'll be gone from home for almost 150 days. Um, the other thing is we just got back from visiting our other daughter who lives in Norway and we're leaving again in two weeks to go to um, the national parks in Utah with our best friends, which we did part of the part of those last year and we're finishing up the trip this year. Yeah, Cami travels so much. I get totally jealous of, you know, but I keep someday when I don't have kids at home, we will have that flexibility too. But yeah, how how many times a year do you think you guys go somewhere well I mean the Florida thing like that's the first two months of the year yeah. and then I know we've gone this year we've gone in April I think we went twice in May we were gone for like almost two weeks we were gone on a trip in June we were gone on a trip in July we were gone for three weeks in August we're going to be that's gone a week. yeah a week this month we I've got two trips in October and another trip in December so, so that's 10 so you win yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you don't have kids at home and you, you know, you don't have that responsibility, you don't have the expense of that. It, it definitely changes things. So just on that note, talking about traveling a lot, I mean, were, are those trips mostly <clears throat> flying wise, um, on miles and points? Um, well, like to Florida, we actually drive cause we need a car, but mm -hmm. I would say um, all of them except maybe one was because we went with some friends who they drove, which we don't really drive on trips anymore, um, very rarely. So yes, the rest of them are definitely on miles and points. And you usually get some free hotel stays along the way too, right? We do. So um, like this last trip that we went on, we stayed in um, Dublin and the whole time we were there, that was on point. Okay. So how has using travel rewards helped you as you were working toward this goal of financial independence? Okay. So one thing is that we haven't lived by family since our kids were like 18 months and two and three, two or three. So it was nice to have a stash of points to always be able to go see them. So sometimes we drove, but then um, when they moved even further away, like it, it just wasn't, it wasn't feasible really to do that, especially when my husband had to work and you only have a week of vacation, right? So that's not, that's not an issue anymore. But back then when it was, when you have a week, you don't want to take two days to drive someplace and two days right. to drive home. That's just crazy. So we could use the um, stash of points that we had to go see family. And the other thing was we lived in different places. So we had friends from the previous places that we still wanted to keep in contact with. So we would use, you know, points and miles to go back and see them too. So by using credit card signup bonuses and charging literally everything, we always had the stash of points that we needed. And 
this was all on our everyday spend. I know you talk about that a lot. We don't live extravagantly. We don't ever buy, you know, huge things. It was basically just what we needed to spend money on. And I don't know if they still do this or not, because um, when we were using American Airlines before we discovered other credit cards, they had deals back then where you could actually earn frequent flyer miles on a mortgage. So when we had a mortgage, I know at least twice we opened mm-hmm. it through who they recommended and we got a bunch of points from that too. Yeah. Here and there, you can find that on some different airlines. Yeah. So we didn't actually start traveling for just vacations besides camping until our girls were six and eight. And my mindset on that was they're not going to remember any of this. Why would we want to spend the money? They would rather go visit their cousins or do that kind of thing. So our first vacation that we actually was actually felt like it was a real vacation. We drove from Dallas to South Padre Island, which was still a very long way. Um, but that was our first foray into actually going on vacations. And I have to say, I had grown up with the mindset that vacation was a waste of money. That's mm-hmm. how my parents viewed vacations. And so, I mean, it had to be a whole mindset shift for me to think, it's okay to spend money going on vacation because that was not how I was brought up. I did not fly on an airplane till after we were married. Um, So then I was homeschooling at the time and I started reading um, books about people who were taking their kids on extended vacations as field trips. Yeah. Um, That's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. So in 2000, we were studying American history and we used our miles Um, to travel to Boston. Uh, We did the Freedom Trail there. We went to New York City. We went to some Broadway plays. We love that kind of stuff. And then we went to Washington, D.C. for a week. We had family that lived there, although we didn't stay with them. We got to spend time with them. And we were gone for 16 days. I remember saying after that vacation, I never want to go to another museum as long as I live. I bet. Yeah. But a great, that was a great experience though for your kids. <laughs> it was a great experience. And they would have been 10 and 12 at the time. That next year, we had a very, very serious car accident. And so after that experience, that was when we started flying all the time. Mm. So that made it even more important for us to um, have a stash of points to be able to do that. And I would say my real hook, besides besides that we had started um, having money set aside for vacation and taking some vacations, um, some vacations was that I was a homeschooling mom and I was with my kids all the time. So some friends of ours had gone on a couple cruises and they said, come on a cruise with us. So we decided to do that. And I am going to tell you that this was my hook into going on vacations because (laughs) there was no cleaning, there was no cooking, there was no grocery shopping, there was no driving, there was no having to choose where we were going to eat for dinner that night. Um, And they like cleaned your room twice a day and gave you fresh towels. And then they put chocolate on my pillow. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a real vacation to me. Uh So it was just like nothing I had ever experienced before. And I wanted to do that again and again. So travel got added into our budget. I don't remember if it was then or not as one of our categories and it became a priority. And I knew that the way to do more of that was to get more points and miles. So I started down that path more intensely. So an example would be like, instead of spending $7,000 to go on a trip, I was only spending $1,000 because I was using my miles and points to fly there, possibly to book a cruise, possibly to, um, you know, pay for cruise excursions, to stay in the hotel the night before the cruise started, to rent a car whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that cut it way down to nothing. And we could take more trips. Oh, and the other thing I would say about that is, okay, so you didn't spend $7,000 on a vacation. So we continue to use that to pay down our house. So rinse and repeat over and over like that's how it accumulates and helps you with the financial independence. 
you're still able to do these fun things and make great memories with your family, but you're not spending so much money on that. And you can use that for other things. Right. You can take that money that you're saving and keep working toward financial independence, whatever way that looks for you. And then once you achieve it, you can use, you can invest that money or just save the money or splurge on your vacation because you just paid zero airfare, you know, do something you wouldn't ordinarily do whatever floats your boat, but you might as well use that money for something else. Right. So I would say, of course, I wish I'd known what I know now about travel rewards when I started 30 years ago. I mean, I've heard some stories that people have told about how they got all these points from these bizarre things that are no longer possible. I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known all that stuff. But I would say our listeners, the people who are listening to this can learn from someone else. They can learn from me and what I didn't do at the beginning and they can take their actions earlier. And one thing I was thinking about when I was working on this was, gosh, I wish I would have kept a record. This sounds like something I would do, but I hadn't thought it. Right. Uh, I can't believe right. you didn't do this. Of all the money that I saved, like now I do that. I'm like, this is how much money, you know, retail price this vacation costs. And this is how much money I actually spent. So um, I know that it would be in the tens of thousands of dollars that we ended up using to help us reach financial independence. Yeah, and that's significant. And and also that you're not taking money that you've paid taxes on and use them to pay for travels. Like you could also take that money pre-tax and invest it or something as another example, you know? Right, right. We could, have, we could have put that in our 401k. And let's talk about, you know, like how you achieve financial independence without completely depriving yourself of everything. Because I definitely hear people out there talking, you know, they're literally are, you know, eating, I don't know, bananas and ramen noodles, <laughs> you know, so that they ha- can put every single penny toward financial independence, you know, so how can you, you did this and you enjoyed your life. You didn't live in a miserly fashion. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, that is definitely not how it was for us. Now I, we were living below our means. So I, I'm not the kind of person like we don't need a fancy new car and I don't go to the mall and shop for my clothes um, and stuff like that. But I also was still living. I mean, you just have to. And I didn't want to feel deprived. I never felt deprived as a kid. When Tom and I first got married, we didn't have a lot of money, but we never felt deprived. We had everything we needed and we had, you know, some some nice things too. So using travel rewards helped us to be able to um, continue to travel and, and not feel deprived. We didn't want to feel that. So I got this quote from a friend recently, and he said, the right balance of living yet using financial independence strategies and travel hacking. I thought that was great. That is good. Yeah. The two, I think just naturally go hand in hand. Um, because I mean, I know for me, like I wouldn't want to not travel for 10 years to save all that money because like my mother-in-law had a stroke, you know, like unexpected. And then she was not able to be able to be as mobile as she would have wanted to be to travel. Or I don't know if my life might end tomorrow, you know, like I want to enjoy my life along the way reasonably. (laughs) Right. Um, Right. And so I just think that's super important. And what travel hacking can really do that for people who love to travel while still accomplishing this. And you're a good example of it. Right. And you're so right about not knowing what tomorrow will bring. Part of our living now mentality was from our car accident. So I would say Mm -hmm. that's something you have to do about, you have to have that living now. Like you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You could have a car accident and die. And I know like since we've moved um, to Indiana, we've had two friends. One passed away from a heart attack at age 48, and another guy um, died from a stroke in his mid 50s. And so we had already come, you know, from having this accident and realizing, okay, we we need to live now because you just don't know what's going to happen to now. Okay, now our friends are passing away. 
Like we really need to step up this game of living. And I think that's also what motivated us for Tom to say, I want to quit working. I don't want to die at my desk. Mm. You know, so those things definitely weighed heavily into our decision to become financially independent a few years, you know, this was about 10 years ago. So we just decided we weren't going to wait to live and using travel rewards have helped us do so many things we never dreamed we'd be able to do. Yeah. And I really believe too, that travel rewards allow you to do more than you would have ever been able to do even with cash. Right. Way more, I think, um, if you understand how how to do it properly in our simple system. (laughs) Right. And and we've got people in the membership who, you know, say all the time, because I flew to Hawaii for free, then I splurged on this thing that I would have never done because I wouldn't have had the funds to do it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And are you, so you're still using travel rewards, even though you've now achieved your goal? just talk about that briefly. Okay. Um, absolutely. Tom and I were talking about this. I'm like, okay, Lynn asked me this question. What's your answer? And he said, absolutely, which is exactly what I said. So, um, I think once you have the mindset of living below your means, it just becomes ingrained in every fiber of your being. And it would be super difficult to shake off at this point. So I really don't ever see us giving that up. Um, And one thing we discovered is that you can use it to bless other people as well. So I've taken my best friend on several trips. We've gone on a couple cruises. We've gone to Sedona. We've gone to Kansas City. Our husbands, you know, know that this relationship is important to us. So they let us do these girl trips together. Um, We've taken friends to uh, both YMCA camps with us in Colorado in 2019, we planned a trip to Ireland with these um, these best friends. We flew everybody over on Delta Sky Miles. We had a big pile of those because that's what my husband flew for work. Mm-hmm. Well, they would have never, ever been able to do a trip like that, you know? Um, so it's just so wonderful to be able to bless other people and to have those experiences with them, with your friends and family, because You can do, you can do that kind of thing for free. And I know we've had people in the membership say, you know, they took their family of seven to Hawaii or, you know, whatever. It's like like kids, friends along and paying for them to come or taking the parents or in-laws along, you know? Right. Exactly. So, um, and one thing is like, we just visited our daughter who lives in Norway and we used the United Airlines excursionist park. And for people that don't know what that is, it's basically United gives you an interim flight between the place you left and the place you're going to. So from America to Europe, we paid for that with miles, but anywhere in Europe, you could fly for free. And then we flew from Dublin to Norway and we had to pay for that. So that whole trip only cost us 59,000 points each. And we got to spend five days in another country. Um, And then, like I said, we spent those five nights in Dublin at um, the Hyatt Centric, and we used points to pay for that. And I used some of my Aer Lingus Avios to pay for the double-decker bus tour. So you get the idea. I figured out we spent less than $1,000 out of pocket for three weeks in Europe. But more importantly than that, we got to spend two weeks with our daughter and her family. And, you know, like, I don't know how much, I wish I would have looked up how much those tickets were at the time, but I think they were over $3,000. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Can you imagine? No, I really cannot. Yeah. What a, what a gift. All right. And then I want to talk about, we, you know, a big part of this, as you alluded to at the very beginning is using a travel credit card to pay for your everyday expenses only, um, in order to continually accumulate miles. So we mentioned Dave Ramsey too, at the beginning. And so there's so many people that follow Dave Ramsey, who has a great program for teaching you how to get out of debt. Um, but he's a big proponent of absolutely no credit cards. So I thought we could just chat about that for a minute because that's a key part of accumulating miles to fly free. Of course, we don't want people to accumulate debt on those cards, but um, he's pretty much no credit cards. So how did you reconcile those two things as a someone who taught Dave Ramsey's program right, of no credit cards to using that 
in order to fly your family free. Okay, so I just have to tell you that on our way home from Florida this year, we actually stopped at Dave Ramsey headquarters in Franklin, Tennessee, because he was doing his live show and we've never seen one. And during the live show, they take a break and you get to meet Dave Ramsey and take your picture with them and you get to speak to him for just a moment. So I got to tell him ourself, myself that we were on our way home for Tom to give us notice to um, retire at age 57. So we were pretty thrilled about that. Um, and that, that was just a fun thing, you know, yeah. to just see the cherry on top of this is what right. we've done, right? Um, I honestly feel like Dave Ramsey has it spot on for people who know nothing about how to handle money and for people who have, who find themselves deeply in debt. Um, he, he wants to help you make a plan, have a plan for every dollar. He wants you to be on a budget, which is we did that. That was an integral part of what we did. People don't understand that when you're on a budget, you actually find money because you realize what you're wasting money on once mm -hmm. you start writing down what you're actually spending. You actually look at it. Yeah. Uh, we were living on a budget and we were living debt free except for our mortgage long before we ever heard of Dave Ramsey, as I said. <laughs> But you know, with this interview coming up, Tom and I had some really good discussions about this topic and realized that even though we used credit cards, we felt like we weren't going in debt because we were paying off our credit cards every month. So I remember once early on, we didn't pay off our credit card. I got the statement. I saw how much interest they charged us. And I said, never again will we do that. Yeah. We have the money in the bank. There's no reason for us to do that. And from now on, we're always going to have the money to pay off our credit card in full every month. And so to me, that's not debt. So that's how I can reconcile that. I know you teach, if you have a problem with that, go in and use it like a debit card, pay it off every day mm -hmm. or for every purchase or whatever. Um, so that's what we've done. Do you think Dave would be okay with that? No, <laughs> but he's, you know, we understand where he's coming from. He's just trying to keep people who have already been in debt from getting back in debt again, you know? So it's just all about, can you know thyself? Can you use a credit card and pay off the balance every month, either every other day or every day, like I teach it, or at least once a month, because if you can't, we don't want you to get into this hobby because then you're like, Cammie said, you're paying very high interest and then you're not traveling free. You're paying very high interest to do that. Um, so, but I like your concept of you're, you're, it's still debt free because you're not carrying debt. That's right. a good way to look at it. Right. Um, and I think too, on that part of it is self-control. I mean, you have to be on a budget. We still keep a budget to this day to the penny. It's a, it's a matter of having self-control over keeping this budget every month, knowing where all your dollars go and knowing, okay, I've got, you know, there were times when people said, Hey, let's go out for lunch after church. And we said, we don't have the money in our budget. I mean, we just had to say, no, we didn't live miserly, but there were some times that we did have to say no to things that other people would say, well, you know, if I just pay the minimum payment on my credit card of $25, I can live however I want. <laughs> right. right. At a very high cost. So yeah, I think it comes down to it's, we would say maybe not don't have credit cards, but don't have credit card debt. Right. Absolutely. That may be the distinction. Um, do you have any last advice? to give our listeners um, who may be embarking on a similar journey to you or hoping to end up where you are now? Yeah, I have a few things. So one thing you always talk about is doing the 20% of effort to achieve 80% of the results and using credit cards to gain um, travel rewards absolutely accomplishes that when you're working towards financial independence. And I know what we were doing before I met you was a much more complicated way of achieving that goal. Now it's a lot simpler and we're traveling more than ever. So in Families Fly Free, we always try to give some action steps um, to wrap things up. And so here are the ones I have. I have start early learning how to use travel rewards to have experiences 
to bless others and to make memories instead of acquiring things. Make a budget and stick to it. Live below your means and live debt free. Increase your standard of giving instead of your standard of living. And so that's one thing we've done with giving away to charity and also blessing other people with free trips and stuff. So we're going to be generous. We're going to be content with what we have. We're going to um, find a mentor who is doing what you want to do or living the life you want to live and follow their advice and make some goals to reach. That was another really big one for us when we made, you know, we said, we're going to live on a budget. That's our goal. We're going to pay our house off by the time we're 40. That was a goal. When we said, we're going to try to achieve financial independence in those five years, that was a goal. So um, it's kind of funny because now we don't really have a goal and we really need another one. Like my, my goal would be, and I don't really ever see this happening, would, to be, would be to have a condo on the beach in Florida that we owned. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we would do that, but that like something like that now that you have financial independence. I know Chris on our team, they just bought a condo in Mexico on the beach. You know, like he told me, in our wildest dreams, we would have never thought that we were going to do this, Be but it was because they achieved financial independence. And there, there's a joy component there. I think, you know, you, it, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent, the perfect financial decision. You have to factor in what brings you joy too. Right. And there's an element of joy in having for you a condo on the beach. Right. <laughs> right. So whatever, you know, your next goal might be. And my last one would be, don't wait to live. That is a great one to end on. Um, I just wanted to, just to add a couple things there on one of your, on your action steps. So, you know, make memories instead of acquiring things. And I would just caution too, sometimes we see people who come in and want to acquire miles, I would say, for the sake of acquiring them instead of for the sake of using them. So I would be careful of that mindset. You're not just trying to accumulate miles for the sake of accumulations. That's really the same thing as accumulating things. You know, um, you're accumulating these miles so that you can use them. And we, we show you how to always have enough. So you don't have to be in scarcity about, I'm not going to have enough, you know, for the next thing. And then on your note about look for a mentor, you know, of course, look for someone who's achieved financial independence who can help you. But if you're looking for someone to help you with travel rewards and you have goals similar to what we teach, you want to take your whole family to as many places as you can go in the U.S., the Caribbean, and Europe, come follow along with us inside the Families Fly Free membership because that's what it's designed to do, to show you what we have figured out that's working for hundreds of other families um, that can work for you too. So, um, Great episode. Those of you who want to learn more about financial independence, um, check out our friends over at Choose FI. We highly recommend that podcast. And I've been on there a couple times because, as we said, this tends to go with travel hacking so that you can keep traveling while achieving this. Um, and thanks to Cami for sharing your story and hopefully inspiring lots of people to do the same. And um, please, if you found this episode to be helpful, we'd love it if you'd give it a quick rating or review that helps our podcast reach more people and is super important. Um, otherwise we will see you on the next episode.